fix that a little bit. Hey, what's up? Last minute live stream. Hopefully, we got audio. They're doing. I was just randomly online and it came across this uh, Fort Hood investigation thing that's being live streamed right now. Going to give it a second for people to join. I have no idea what they're going to talk about. They did mention Vanessa Guillen. Uh, so let me give it a second here. Let me put some titles and see if Vanessa Guillen. A second for people to join. I am working on a live stream for tonight uh, with regards to Alexis Starkey. We got some people. Hey, welcome, everybody. People that are joining. Let me see real quick here. And into Vanessa's death, coupled with how Ian. This will be a long. Fort Hood, uh, the independent review of Fort Hood's command climate. So this will be a longer statement. The murder of specialist Vanessa Guillen shocked our conscience and brought attention to deeper problems. The initial investigation into Vanessa's death, coupled with high numbers of crimes and deaths at Fort Hood, has revealed a series of missteps and multiple failures in our system and within our leadership. For that reason, on July 30th, I directed the Undersecretary of the Army, Mr. James McPherson, to establish an independent review committee to review the culture at Fort Hood. Secretary McPherson, with the help of the League of United Latin American Citizens and some members of Congress, selected a diverse and highly experienced panel to determine whether the command climate and culture at Fort Morning. Hood Morning. Welcome. and the surrounding military community reflected the Army's values, including safety, respect, inclusiveness, and a commitment to diversity and workplaces and communities free from sexual harassment and sexual assault. The panel, led by Chris Swecker, also included Jonathan Harmon, Carrie Ricci, Keta Rodriguez, and Jack White. You have an opportunity to speak with them shortly, and we will make their report available to the public. Over the course of 103 days, the panel surveyed 31,612 soldiers interviewed 647 soldiers, and met with civic and elected leaders, local law enforcement leaders, and the local district attorneys. On November 9, the panel briefed the Army senior leaders and provided nine findings and 70 recommendations. The findings of the committee identified major flaws with sexual harassment and assault response prevention program from implementation reporting, and adjudication. Fundamental issues with Fort Hood Criminal Investigation Command field office activities that led to unaddressed problems on Fort Hood. And finally, a command climate at Fort Hood that was permissive of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Further, the committee made 70 recommendations to improve the following areas. Overall sharp program structure, Fort Hood Criminal Investigation Field Office Command Activities, Army Missing Soldier Protocols, Fort Hood Crime Prevention and Response Activities, Army-wide Command Climate Issues, and Fort Hood Public Affairs Activities. The tragic death of Vanessa Guillen and a rash of other challenges at Fort Hood forced us to take a critical look at our systems, our policies, and ourselves. But without leadership, systems don't matter. This is not about metrics, but about possessing the ability <laughs> to have the human decency to show compassion for our team. Thanks, Josephine. <laughs> and to look out for the best interests of our soldiers. This report, without a doubt, will cause the Army to change our culture. I have decided to accept all these findings in whole. I'm just going to pause it for a second. It's live, but I'm going to pause it for a second. For people that don't know what's going on, uh, Vanessa Guillen is the soldier that went missing. And um, Fort Hood has like this whole history 
of soldiers going missing and deaths. And I, I've covered a couple of the stories. I did Vanessa Guillen. I did um, this guy, Gregory Weedle. And there was another, I thought there was another one. Maybe I, I only did those two. And so uh, this is now them, I guess, explaining or talking about the investigation. It's kind of crazy that all these soldiers were going missing and being found dead on a military base. <laughs> you know, it's just like there was even a whole thing of I thought one, I don't know. I don't remember the exact details, but there was a whole thing of like prostitution or something like that, too. Some weird stuff going on at this base in Texas. So in response. We have created the People First Task Force to map out a plan to tackle them. We have formed a mechanism to ensure yes, we have the right systems and resources while focusing on commitment over compliance. While the independent review focused on the command climate and culture at Fort Hood, the findings contained in the committee's report impact the entire army of more than 1 million soldiers 247,000 civilians and their families. The People First Task Force will analyze the findings and 70 recommendations in the report, develop a plan to address the issues identified by the committee. I almost forgot about and reevaluate all the details of the story. And programs. Yeah, somebody was arrested too. The Army will begin implementation by March 2021. The task force chairs mm. are Ms. Diane Randon. Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff G2, Lieutenant General Gary Brito, the Army G1, and Sergeant Major Julie Guerra, Army G2. I've also signed a new missing soldier policy. The policy will assist in tracking and finding missing soldiers. It's under. It Rashida. clarifies Good expectations morning. and responsibilities Sorry, of the Annie, commanders what's up? and law enforcement authorities, focusing on the first 48 hours a soldier is missing. Mm. It creates new processes oh, for oh, soldiers shocking. reporting to duty status. I don't know, Tori. Status. I got to look into that. For supporting missing soldiers' families and aids in identifying whether the absence is voluntary before mm. calling it absent without leave. And finally, we need the right leadership. I've determined the issues at Fort Hood are directly related to leadership failures. Whoa. Leaders drive culture and are responsible for everything the unit does or does not happen to do. I am gravely disappointed that leaders failed to effectively create a climate that treated all soldiers with dignity and respect, and that failed to reinforce everyone's obligation to prevent and properly respond to allegations of sexual harassment and sexual assault. Because of this, mm. to restore trust and confidence and accountability, I directed the relief and or suspension of commanders and other leaders from the core. Oh, to snap. The squad level. Okay. They're doing I something at least. The relief of the three core deputy commanding general for support. The third armored cavalry regiment command team. And suspended the first cavalry division command team. Pending the results of a new investigation into the command climate of the division. Hmm. In total, 14 leaders have been relieved or suspended from their positions. Wow. In addition, some changes. We're directing investigation regarding criminal investigation command resourcing policies and procedures. Accountability and transparency are foundational as we move forward. We have a great deal of work ahead of us. This is an initial step to addressing and fixing these issues. Even though we are part of one of the most respected institutions in the world. July 2021. Living up to the American people's Shit. trust is something we have to do every day. I believe in this institution and its officers, non-commissioned officers, soldiers, civilians, and right, their families. Right. With every fiber of my being, because of the extraordinary things they do on a daily basis. I'm confident in our leader's ability to overcome this challenge. And to continue to win our morning, Lisa. wars while caring for our people. General McConnell. Okay. Ralph, what's Good up? Good afternoon. Uh, we appreciate the work of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee and the feedback that this report 
has given us. We own the Fort results. Bragg. And, you know, Jesus. we've asked a lot of the Army and of Fort Hood over the last 19 years during continuous deployments to combat. And we know in the Army that we are not perfect. But what makes us far from it, the greatest army in the world is that we recognize where we must change. We acknowledge oh, wow. our issues and we fix them. Prior to coming here, I talked to Mrs. Guillen, Vanessa's mother. And I told her that we're going to fix these issues and change Bieber! the culture that allowed so, them. Hopefully, to I'm not too loud. Bieber, I what's told up? Her we must and will provide a safe and secure environment for American sons and daughters that serve in the Army. Uh, As the Secretary said, we are holding leaders accountable, and we will fix this. Tomorrow, we are briefing the Army they're getting rid of people on this report, and we will ensure it is understood, and our plan to move forward Cleaning will be the implemented throughout the Army. We have been trusted to lead the world's greatest soldiers. It is our sacred duty to protect our soldiers so we can defend our nation. That is what we do. Thank you. Lita Baldor, first question. Um, first question um, is, um, can you address uh, just more broadly why um, it sounds as though uh, General White is not included among those um, touched by the administrative actions, why not? And then also, how widespread do you believe these problems are beyond Fort Hood? Because you seem to suggest that um, 19 years of war on on this and maybe it's one of the causational factors. Is that what you are saying? Um, Alita, it's Ryan McCarthy. Uh, mm. With respect to General White, he was deployed for 13 months uh, in, our, in our standard practice, I'd like General McConville to comment as well. But uh, General White was deployed for 13 months. Our standard practice is that we, we uh, delegate a senior mission commander to take the role of running the garrison activities. Uh, so in this case, it had been a standard practice that we've used for, I think, over a decade. Hey, what's uh, up? Welcome. In the formation. Uh, with respect to hey, the B. comments. I hope you're doing we well. I hope you're recovering. Related to where is, we, don't, we are concerned that there, there could be other uh, systemic challenges across the formation. And that's why, to the chief's point, we're going to utilize mm. this report as a means to uh, look at systems and programs. It's about time, right? So leadership approaches to how we uh, address these, these these difficult issues. Chief, anything you want to add? Uh, just just on, on, on General White, I think it's really important. He, he did a fabulous job uh, in, in Iraq over the last 13 days. And, and leadership is about presence. And when you're you're in Iraq for 13 months, uh, that's why we appoint a general officer to be the senior commander. And as far as other issues, uh, we're about excellence. Uh, you know, I, I said we're not perfect, but we strive for excellence. We need Sharon, to take a hard up? look at ourselves. That's why Both we're Sharon's. the best army in the world. Good morning. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to take these results. We're going to make sure that every single leader uh, sees these results. You know, some will say we reflect society. I don't want to reflect society in these type of issues. I want to make sure that we have a environment where everyone is treated with dignity and respect and everyone takes care of each other. And we expect our leaders to do that. And that's what we're going to do. And we have time for one final question in the room. Louis Martinez. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, General, um, you talked about how this is going to change the Army, but why did it take a review panel and why did it take Vanessa Guillen's disappearance and murder for you to look inward at these programs that obviously now, in retrospect, look like they've failed massively? The, the, uh, the I think the, the level, the caliber of work that was provided in this uh, independent review uh, panel uh, brought a lot, brought a fresh look and uh, helped us look at a lot of challenges uh, that we have had that are potentially systemic, but some of them were uh, also within the leadership. So I think the fresh eyes and having some other support has helped us in this process. Chief, if you want to add. If I could follow up, sir. I mean, yeah. Yes, this is leadership. With so they're saying that supposedly 14 Army leaders at Fort Hood have been fired or suspended due to the report with all this stuff with the uh, 
I mean, I think the whole thing that opened this thing wide was the Vanessa Guillen case. It says here, according to the USA Today, uh, an independent investigation into tragedies at Fort Hood, including a bludgeoning murder of special, uh, well, I'm not sure, SPC is special. Actually, I can't. Oops, I don't know what that means. What does that mean in ranking? Specialist, military specialist. Okay, not bad. Uh, Vanessa Gay found that the leadership at the Army's largest base permitted sexual harassment and assault and other crimes to occur with little consequence. Regards to this issue, but it sounds like the report says that Sharp Specialist first is class. structurally not working, um, and that is an Army-wide program, so then why can't you say that the, star, uh, but not enough. the That's program true. itself needed complete restructuring, or why wasn't it uh, updated regularly so that you could see that there were issues at hand? Um, really this body of work has identified things that we had not seen previously. That's why we uh, have, have accepted all of the findings in whole. Um, you know, I previously have seen independent panels that have looked at uh, the mishandling of nuclear weapons or Walter Reed. Uh, a lot of great reporting, mm. quite frankly, as well as outside fresh perspective, help us look at ourselves and see challenges that we didn't see. And uh, it's, uh, you'll have them come out here in a minute, but uh, they helped us and that's going to help us uh, with the institution so we can get better across the board. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Specialist, um, the secretary yeah. does not have much time. Um, the, yes, the, there was a press release that's, that's um, should be in your inbox now. So uh, the Fort Hood Independent Review Panel will be out. Um, we're going to switch, bring out the new panel, and they'll be here to take your questions. Thank you very much. Oh, so there's an independent review panel coming on. By the way, this was just very last minute. I just saw this, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. I never even updated the story. I forgot to update it. I did a couple of videos on Vanessa Guillen, but I never updated it with the with the outcome, which is what I should have done. Army leaders are firing or suspending 14 officers and enlisted soldiers. Ordering policy changes to address the chronic leadership failures at the base that contributed to a widespread pattern of violence, including murder, sexual assault, and harassment. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Chamberlain from Army Public Affairs. Today, you'll hear from the members of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee, Chris Swecker, mm. Jonathan Harmon, Kerry Ritchie, Keita Rodriguez, and Jack White. This briefing will it last probably is more. It's minutes, true. ending no later than one. Before I introduce the committee members, I have several announcements. If you RSVP'd for this briefing, you previously received an embargoed press release along with an embargoed copy of the executive summary of the report of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee. That embargo is now lifted. Very soon, you'll receive an updated version of the press release with a second release outlining the accountability actions Secretary McCarthy just announced. The Army's new Fort Hood Independent Review website, army.mil slash Fort Hood Review, will go live shortly. On this site, you'll find both press releases, a link to download the 136-page redacted report, wow. and additional background materials. That's going to be interesting to this see. This briefing will begin with an opening statement from Mr. Swecker on behalf of the committee, Afterward, the committee members will take questions relating to the report and their findings and recommendations. Hey, Christine. Welcome. For the Q&A segment, That's a long please allow me to acknowledge you before list. asking your question. Bunch of pages. Please provide your name and affiliation. Limit yourself to one question and one Tim Miller. I'll call on reporters in the room and on the phone line. I'll provide a warning when we have time for one more question. And now Church. Mr. Swecker will read an opening statement on behalf of the committee. Good afternoon and, and thank you for attending today. Uh, my name is Chris Swecker. I'm the chair of the Fort Hood Independent Review Committee. I'm a practicing attorney in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm also of counsel with Miller Martin mm -hmm. out of uh, Tennessee. Um, and I'm retired from the FBI after 24 years, uh, retiring as assistant director of the FBI. To my far left is Jonathan Harmon. He's chairman of McGuire Woods Law Firm. He is, he is a nationally recognized trial attorney who previously served as an Army officer at Fort Hood, 
in the 1st Cavalry Division after graduating from West Point. Uh, to my immediate left in the front is uh, Carrie Ricci. She is a retired Army JAG officer who served three years at Fort Hood, including as trial counsel and is now a senior executive serving as an associate attorney uh, general counsel for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Just behind Ms. Ricci is uh, Keta Rodriguez. She is a retired Marine Corps officer who served 20 years on active duty. She currently serves as regional director for Four Block, which is a veteran serving nonprofit organization. To my right is Jack White. He's a partner at FHL, a law firm where his practice focuses on government investigations and civil rights claims. He served as a law clerk at the U.S. Supreme Court after graduating from West Point. So the guy supposedly involved with the whole killing of Vanessa. So this guy off himself, they say, right? But then he has like an estranged wife that they believe was also involved or knew something. And so she's in custody in the way because I never updated the story. The way she was found was uh, in a storage case. I never look back into the story. I'll just show you this. I'm not going to play the clip right now. After this live stream, I'll play this little clip. But I guess she was found in some sort of storage case. Tim Miller. Damn. Soldiers and missing soldier protocols. What's up, Liz? Welcome. We began our work immediately. California. The committee members who had never met each other prior to their appointment were asked were tasked to organize themselves. Yeah, I heard about the strategy for the review. Gather oh, relevant I didn't know facts he, and for complete her. a final report to the secretary Tim's within ninety days. Production. All of the members have day jobs with significant responsibilities. We couldn't cast those aside. However, we accepted this appointment based on our shared belief yeah, they did, that the independent body could indeed assess the serious issues at hand and, if necessary, provide a roadmap towards constructive change. Each member of the committee accepted this appointment with the intention and a, and a hope of supporting the mission and well-being of our brave soldiers. The final report was delivered to the Secretary of the Army on November 6th. We briefed the Secretary of the Army and the Army Command on November 18th of this year. Before we go any further, let me emphasize that the Secretary, mm. Secretary McCarthy, Under Secretary McPherson, and Chief of Staff McConville provided us absolute independence to do our job. We were authorized access to every available source of information, and we were provided a full Army staff, including a Brigadier General, two Colonels, several Lieutenant Colonels, and a Master Sergeant, each of whom stood ready to support our mission. Although the establishment of an independent committee of civilians to review U.S. Army command and its actions is mm. not unprecedented, it is extremely wow. rare, and it reflects a sincere desire to identify the issues and address them. The secretary and undersecretary also approved and facilitated the addition of five former FBI special agents and civilian administrative support to provide much needed assistance to the team. Breeze, breeze. Hey, welcome. We visited Fort Hood for 19 That's days in August and September. We conducted 647 individual interviews. We did 80 group interviews, which encompassed over 1,800 soldiers. And we conducted over 140 specialized interviews of various stakeholders on and off the post. Wow. We retrieved and analyzed thousands of pages of documents, commissioned 49 formal research projects, and conducted a survey tailored for this review, which drew over 31,000 responses from the Fort Hood community, representing what we were told is 100% of the targeted audience. The review focused on the period 2018 through 2020. However, if oh, information wow. from the last five years was, con was considered, if it was deemed relevant to the review. Hmm. After three months of diligent, diligent work, the, the committee issued nine findings and 70 constructive recommendations. The report mm -hmm. leads off with finding number one, which states that the command at Fort Hood was ineffective in its implementation of the Sexual Harassment Assault Response and Prevention Program, the SHARP program. This was due to underemphasis of the program outside the three core headquarters and a failure to culturally integrate the program through the enlisted ranks to where almost 90% of sexual assault victims are found. The committee noted that while the Fort Hood leadership afforded the highest priority, to maintaining equipment, conducting field training, 
and ensuring deployment capability, a series of command elements executed these duties in a manner that was at the expense of the health and safety of all soldiers, but particularly for women at the brigade level and below. This dearth of command emphasis on the SHARP program adversely impacted mission readiness in terms of morale, reenlistments, and recruitments. The committee also found that soldier accountability was not strictly enforced and there was no missing soldier protocols for first line supervisors. Mm. This resulted in ad hoc responses to soldiers who failed to report and may have been in jeopardy. With respect to the crime issues at Fort Hood, the committee determined that the crime environment within the surrounding cities and counties is commensurate with, with similar size areas in Texas and around the United States. However, serious crime problems on Fort Hood have gone unaddressed because the installation is in a fully reactive posture. Leaders across a series of commands failed to use best practices in the areas of public safety to develop and execute crime suppression strategies. The committee found that morning, the serious morning. crime problems on the installation at Fort Hood require proactive command action to mitigate. Fort Hood, the committee also found that the Fort Hood CID detachment had various inefficiencies that adversely impacted accomplishments of its mission. The committee wishes to thank the, Sec the Secretary of the Army, the Undersecretary of the Army, and the Army Chief of Staff, and the Army staff that they provided for the strong support they provided to this committee. Oh, thanks. Uh, so I just want to add that we MO3G. were all fully immersed in all Welcome. aspects of, of the review, but each of us had a focus you area. Coming by. So when you ask a question, and, a member uh, we may have that person come up to the podium and we'll switch positions. So bear with us as we do the switch. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swecker. We'll now take our first question, which goes to Lita Baldor, AP, on the phone. Hi, um, I had a question earlier, so I'll let someone else ask. Go ahead. Oh, uh, taking Kyle phone calls? Renfer, Military Times, also on the phone. Oh. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, so we just heard that, you know, 14 senior commanders or 14 commanders there at Fort Hood were relieved or suspended. Um, but how far back do the problems that you guys identified go? Uh, is this something that just developed in the past 12 months or does this extend, That's a good question. You know, um, how far back? back here? How long has this been in development? Kenya. Well, I'm going to wow. refer to the report. We, we look back as far as early as 2014. Um, there there wow. were issues that were called out. If you look at it in terms of risk management, it became a known risk very early in the process. We did not fix accountability Stacey, what's up? on Welcome. any specific general officer or any particular commander because we, for that very reason, particularly in the last five years, uh, which was really the more relevant time period, we just didn't, it was, it, it was not an act of commission. These were acts of omission, if you will. These were things that were not done. These were not things that were done that were um, to the detriment of, of, the, of the soldiers, particularly the female soldiers. Does anybody else want to add to that? Hmm. Okay, next question. Haley Britsky. Thank you. Uh, Haley Britsky with Task and Purpose. Um, in your conversations with soldiers and your interviews with them, can you talk oh. about some of the points that you heard repeatedly? Search um, teams the were back the in the they spot where they found human remains in a shallow grave. Roughly 30 yeah. 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 The, the individual Today, interviews especially were pretty revealing. Uh, we and hold on a second. Sorry about that. Found the first piece of evidence that led them to believe the search for Vanessa Guillen was close to over. We know immediately that yep, we're, we're in the right spot. Texas equity started playing on its own. Okay. Okay. 500 of, of the 647, 503 were female soldiers. What's up? Welcome. What we found was that there was a fear of retaliation, all forms of retaliation, stigmatism, ostracism, career uh, derailing a career. Um, assignments, work assignments, and that sort of thing. Um, there was mm. there was a fear and, and a, a founded fear that the confidentiality of the reporting process would be compromised. Um, there was a fear or there was a lack of, of any appreciation for the results or the response because the, it took so long to get an, an adjudication that people didn't, never saw the adjudication, so they lost... They lost faith in that. Jojo Beans, so welcome. There was, and and I, there, there are other, many other things that came out of the interviews, if, as you will read in the report. But let me open it up to the other panel members. Does anybody else 
Uh, yeah, I, I will say that uh, Keta and Carrie interviewed, uh, did the individual interviews, and they may have something to say about that, but they were very revealing. I just want to add that one of the things that the soldiers at Fort Hood, many of them needed, was to be believed. And that mm. was what we did. We listened. And so if any of them see this, I want them to know we believe you. And that was a really, that's a really important takeaway, was to believe. That's all I wanted to add. Mm. Think Roy, what's up? Welcome. As Mr. Uh, Mr. Swecker just uh, stated, um, I spent the bulk of my time during the course of the, our time at Fort Hood interviewing these individuals. Um, as he mentioned, 503 of the 647 were women. Um, we made a very concerted effort to wow. interview every single woman. How much 503 out of the interviewing these individuals? Um, as he mentioned, 503 of the 647 were 503 out of the 647 were women. Damn women um, we made a very concerted effort to interview every single woman within specific units um, in particular the unit that Vanessa Guillen belonged to and what we did discover was which was one of the really shocking um, elements or parts of, of the interview period were the number of unreported sexual harassment and sexual assault wow. um, incidents of the 503 Jesus. women that we interviewed, we discovered 93 um, credible accounts of sexual assault. Of those, only 59 were reported. Um, and we also found mm. 135, uh, I'm sorry, 217 uh, unreported accounts of sexual harassment. Wow. Um, so that's a really significant number of those. The hell is going on over there? Were reported. Jesus Christ. And so what we discovered during the course of those interviews is that due to the lack of of confidence in the system, that lack of confidence absolutely affected affects the reporting um, of those incidents. And obviously, if we're not able to capture the those incidents, then it's almost impossible to address that. But again, as Mr. Swecker alluded to, there were other indicators that this was a problem. Um, and so that's something that the report really focused on. And this interview, the yeah. interview period of all of those individuals really focused on just letting people speak to us. Um, they knew that we were an independent panel. None of us are on active duty, which I think mm. was a very significant, uh, very significant in their willingness to speak with us and to just believe as Ms. Uh, Ms. Ritchie just said. Thank you. Uh, next question will go to the phone. Jasmine Caldwell, KCN6, hey, Texas. Best That's friend, all for those of us on the phone. Colonel Station of Hood. It's a hot mess. I want you to identify yourselves before you speak. Yes. Um, panelists, if you could, uh, committee members, if you oh, could identify yourselves crazy. before you speak, that would help the people on the phone. Good reminder. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine Caldwell, did you have a question? Hi, yes. Um, of the, um, you were just talking about the reported sexual assault and harassment um, on Fort Hood. Um, out of the ones that were reported, were they properly handled? Um, we, it was all over the place in terms of adjudications. So when you say properly handled, um, the ones that were reported went through the process. If they were sexual assaults, they went through the Criminal Investigative Division, a detachment there for investigation. If they were harassment, there, there was an appointed investigating officer out of the uh, brigade where the uh, complaint took place. Mm. What, we, what we saw were, uh, and this, this may be an area where Ms. Ricci can, can address it as well, because she was a former JAG officer and she concentrated in, in this part of it. We saw a lot of delayed justice, if you will, the old saying, justice delayed, justice denied. The process was so long and drawn out hey, that most people never saw the actual result. So there was no deterrent, or, or at least there was no visible deterrent. <laughs> uh, we found that there were delays were built into the process and nobody was monitoring the life cycle of a sexual assault or sexual harassment complaint. So Jesus nobody Christ. really knew how long it took. Nobody had the responsibility to track how long it took or, or different parts of the process. Um, and that, let me let me ask uh, Ms. Ricci to come up and address that as well, if, if you will. This is pretty big. I mean. Sure. Um, I don't have too much more to add. I will say that at Fort Hood, 
Um, they have really organized themselves well to prosecute sexual assaults. They're not the easiest cases to try, and they have some expertise. Um, but what we found, as Chris mentioned, was that there are delays in the process that become uh, very troublesome for a victim. Mm. Imagine that you're still waiting for justice more than a year later. Um, so I, I can't really add too much more. It's all in the report, but we did find some areas where um, improvement could be found. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I'm Trace Garnier with Newsy. I've followed this Jason, issue what's up, man? a lot uh, as far as sexual assaults in the military. And one of the things that I've found when I've interviewed different survivors and also former OSI agents were uh, one of the issues was they keep changing those who are investigating it. So you have one person mm. who investigates it and he's like, oh, snap, I have to deploy. Let me pass this documentation mm. to someone else. Now they have to pick it up. They're new to it. They don't know the case. And a lot of times that's what's dragging it on. And also a lot of evidence is being lost because of it. So what are you guys, uh, do you recommend uh, ways to fix that issue where you're not having multiple people investigating the same issue and just kind of passing it off from one person to the next? And so the report is very detailed about the criminal investigation division. Sorry about that. I'm just gonna have to close that one. And recommendations he keeps playing in the background. And on that, I will have uh, Mr. Swecker continue to talk on that topic because he did a very detailed review. Hmm. So we, we did indeed look at the whole process. Everybody has, there are different components that have a role. The JAG officers have a role, CID has a role. What we found within CID, and this, this may not be just at Fort Hood, is that they were using Fort Hood as a training ground for CID agents. High turnover, uh, High turnover. fairly chronic understaffing throughout the time period that we looked at, and inexperience. So very of the 30, 45 special agents assigned there, there were probably about 35, I think we determined there yeah, were actually working ring. cases. That's true. Out of those 35, there might have been three or four that had more than two years of experience. So they were rotating through. They were coming out of Fort Leonard, Leonard Wood, going straight to Fort Hood, uh, uncredentialed apprentice agents. And then within two years, they were rotating out very quickly. So you, to your point, there was a lot of attrition uh, of the case agents and the agents working these investigations. Many of them were over-assigned. Yes, Some you of did. the investigative tools that most law enforcement agencies have, they didn't necessarily have at their fingertips cell phone tracking, uh, uh, mirroring or extracting information from cell phones and mobile devices, which is very critical investigative techniques in today's investigations. Um, they needed more and better equipment and, and much faster turnover. There were delays in, in area, other areas as well. When, when a pass off goes to the JAG officers or to the, jet, to the command uh, military justice, justice advisor, there were delays there in getting an opinion. Sorry to hear cause. that, AP. There were delays in getting an assignment of a victim counsel assigned to the victim. So all of that combined and conspired to make Carol, a very up? long and drawn out process. Um, anyone else? Sexual assault yes, in the ahead. business field. Yeah, I'm Christina Londoño with Telemundo. Um, I was wondering how, how instrumental is Vanessa Guillen's family in this investigation? And, and who talked to her? I'm gonna hand the, the podium over to Jack White who did talk to the family and has some perspectives for you on that. So uh, this whole committee was precipitated by the unfortunate events with uh, Specialist Guillen. Mm. And as we put together our methodology Talking with the family to engage in a two-way communication uh, was important to us at the outset. At the outset, we wanted to communicate to the family uh, that their perspective was important and that something was being done about uh, what they had experienced. But in looking at the culture, we wanted to hear from them about what their experience was. Uh, when their daughter was missing, uh, when the search was ongoing, uh, what were the interactions with the command? All of that is a component of the culture. So Miss Ritchie and I sat down with the family, Mrs. Guillen, Mr. Guillen, 
their daughters. Uh, and we talked for hours to understand what their experience was. Uh, indeed, uh, that's I true, Sean. With Mrs. Guillen as recently as this morning to inform her of what was happening today and to assure mm. her that the conversation that she had with us was meaningful. We learned a lot about their experience, uh, and whatever we learned is reflected in the report and will not be lost. Hmm. Were they happy with the recommendations that are coming through? Do they feel that it made an impact? Because that's what they were fighting for this whole time. Uh, I, I do not want to speak for them. Uh, I walked away from my conversation with Mrs. Guillen this morning, believing that she is pleased that there is progress being made. Uh, I do not believe that she has had the benefit, that the family has had the benefit of reviewing the report and our findings and yeah, recommendations. What the report has. It's... Next question will go to the phone. Matt Cox, military.com. Do you have a question? Mm. Yes, hi, thank you for doing this. Um, I did have a question about, you know, your your findings on the uh, Fort Hood Criminal Investigation Detachment. Uh, you know, one of the big things of this was that the Guillen family, you know, said that um, Vanessa Guillen, you know, said she was told them that she was uh, the victim of uh, sexual harassment and, and uh, possibly assault. And CID was very adamant that, well, we found no evidence of that. There was, you know, we found no credible evidence uh, of anything like that. Are, are you saying that that's, you know, a, a flawed finding and that hey, Miranda. Uh, you fought, was there any evidence or, you know, that you found or can you speak to that as far as what that says, you know, what these findings about the CID detachment say to that, you know, that, of uh, whether she was, whether there was evidence that maybe had been overlooked. That makes sense? Um, that is the, the subject of a separate Army investigation, mm. which is going very deep into that area. I don't want to step on an investigation. I will say this. There, there is a misunderstanding on one part of that. CID did not find any evidence that Specialist Robinson sexually harassed Vanessa Guillen. And I'll leave it at that um, because it's, we, we looked at the Guillen case as a case study in terms of the overall broader topic that we were looking at and the subjects that we were looking at. But once the, the separate investigation was announced, we did not, we, we are not the investigating body for- The Robinson name that they're talking about is they're saying that Robinson was linked to the Vanessa Guillen murder. And so the CID stated that they didn't find any evidence, I think, of sexual assault. I think that's, the, that's what they just said. Uh, and supposedly this guy killed himself after he was being confronted by police officers, for those that missed the story. Uh, the issues involving the potential sexual harassment. And he's 20 years old. For, I'm looking at Wikipedia. He's 20 years old. Um, his girlfriend, let's see, the, Cecilia... Celia, I think that's how it's pronounced, Aguilar, 22, described by authorities as the girlfriend of Aaron Robinson and a strange wife of another soldier. So these are the people they're saying that are involved with Vanessa Guillen, uh, Aaron David Robinson and C Celia and Aguilar. Or any other issues involving Vanessa Guillen inside her unit. I'm not dodging this question. It's just a, it's an ongoing thing, and we don't want to taint that investigation in any way. <laughs> Okay, Courtney. Syrup. Just do follow on. Ma'am, you mentioned a bunch of numbers about 503 uh, accounts. And I, I'm wondering if you can just clarify them because you said there were 217 unreported accounts of sexual harassment. Is that correct? So, but then you also said that some, about half of them had been reported. Can you just run through those numbers again, do you mind? Yes, um, during the course of our interviews, mm -hmm. it was 647 individual interviews that included both men and women, but there were uh, there, 503 women that were interviewed. Of those, um, we discovered 93 credible accounts of sexual assault. And again, those were just 
individuals or soldiers who were telling us that this had happened to them. Um, of those 59, when we asked the question, which was part of part of the interview, did you report this or was it reported? The answer was no. Uh, I'm sorry, was yes, 59 of those. That's That was the extent of those. For sexual harassment, we discovered 217 credible accounts of sexual harassment of those. And I'll give you that specific number that we're actually reporting. I wonder if they should kind of define sexual harassment. I mean, it, I guess maybe there's many different meanings. Is that just like, you know, I don't know. Sexually making sexual advances by not doing um, something. For those of you on the phone, this is Miss Rodriguez speaking. Yep. And all of these. Being this an is unwelcome and inappropriate sexual remark or physical advances in a workplace. It says phys physical advances too, or another professional or social situations. Numbers. These specific numbers are included in the report. There were no. Uh, it was. Um, I apologize. Vaccine. I don't know the number. It is in the report. Yes, those specific numbers are actually um, called out in the report. And then, Ms. Ritchie, can I just get you to expand a little bit on what you meant when you said that people just wanted to be believed? Were people, were, were women not coming forward with reporting this and not being believed and not reporting a lot of what you heard? Um, it was two things. It was uh, cases where uh, there was either no resolution or an unsatisfactory resolution, uh, which happens. Um, and once it happens with one soldier, e every soldier in the unit learns of what's happening. And for the other women in that unit, it became a sense that they didn't believe us. Even if they served as a witness, um, we weren't believed. And then other women would say, because of what happened to s this soldier, I wouldn't feel comfortable coming forward. So there was an overall sense that there is that reluctance to report because who is going to believe us, especially for a junior enlisted woman, and especially one who maybe isn't their star soldier at the moment. There's that reluctance and that feeling that we won't be believed. And there were soldiers who just didn't report because they felt that. So just being able to talk one on one and to hear their very personal and sometimes very difficult stories, to be able to tell them and to, it was a little bit cathartic for many of them because someone was listening and they felt that they were being heard. So it was important to me to say, we heard you and we believe you. Cynthia, welcome. Hope you're doing good. Let's go to the phone, Carson Frame, Texas Public Radio. Are you Hope on the line or do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, essentially, it boils down to um, you, you've looked over the SHARP program um, and the criminal investigative response at Fort Hood. Um, how much would you say uh, of these issues are Fort Hood specific versus enterprise wide and Army, Army problem? Uh, this is Jack White. I'll start here. I'm sure that. Uh, Mr. Swecker will follow me. Uh, I want to start with our charter. Uh, our charter was to look at Fort Hood, and that is what we did. But we are not oblivious to the fact that, you know, this is one army, uh, and Fort Hood is potentially emblematic of uh, other things going on in the army. SHARP is an army-wide program. So some of our observations while we saw them at Fort Hood may very well uh, uh, be similar at other installations. Mm. A great number of our recommendations are Fort Hood specific because that's where we were on the ground. And at Fort Hood, our methodology permitted us to kick the tires on just about everything uh, at Fort Hood. But some of our recommendations look beyond just Fort Hood because, uh, as I said, the SHARP program is an Army-wide program. Some of our recommendations in other areas uh, look beyond Fort Hood as well. Chris? Uh. <laughs> uh, this is Ken. John Harmon. You know, I agree uh, with what Jack has described, and it became very apparent 
uh, as we were going through the investigation um, and then afterwards that the Army was going to take these and apply them broader. And you heard from the secretary and you heard from the chief. And, you know, as Jack indicated, our charter was just to Fort Hood. But, you know, we have four of the five members on this panel have served in the military, two of us at Fort Hood. Oh, and wow. so we know what it's like. And so we were very pleased to hear from the secretary and the chief I about um, using this army wide. So, again, our charter was focused solely on Fort Hood. But as Jack uh, articulated and as, again, the secretary and the chief have said, they're going to use this to make army wide changes, which we we applaud. Well, and, and just just to add to that, those 49 research projects that we commissioned went deep and they made comparisons to other installations across the Army. So we, we weren't, as, as was mentioned, we're not, we weren't oblivious to what was going on at other installations around the Army. We made a lot of comparisons to how, how things were going at, 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 at other installations. And we also heard stories from soldiers who had served at other installations. So we, we did note, however, that in many cases, Fort Hood was an outlier in things like AWOL, suicides, and, and other, uh, other issues uh, in comparison to some of these other installations. So there were, there were, Fort Hood was enough of an outlier uh, that we felt like we really, really had to concentrate on what we had in front of us. Sir? Um, we're talking about 70 recommendations, and Secretary McCarthy said that he's going to take all of them. Um, I would like to know what the role of this panel will be moving forward for accountability purposes to make sure those changes are implemented. So, so the People's First Task Force has been established. Uh, one of the colonels that we worked with very closely and supported us is the chief of staff for that task force. Uh, we'll be in touch with him and he'll be in touch with us. And we will be in some sense, uh, over, not overseeing it directly, but we'll be watching the implementation of, of these 70 recommendations. We didn't expect, nor, nor, nor did we ever uh, think that all 70 recommendations would be accepted. So that's, you know, that's a bit of a surprise, but I think it reflects um, a willingness on the part of the secretary, the undersecretary, and the chief of staff to, to fix things. Um, it was a risk to, to bring an independent review committee in. We recognize that. We could have gone anywhere and done anything. And we wanted to do this right, and we wanted to do this fairly. And, and we're, very, we're very happy with the way the Army has accepted these recommendations. I hear the same thing, Ken. Forward. That's all I'm going to hear, too. Uh, next question on the phone, Alex Horton, Washington Post. Did you have a question? Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, you, know, you guys have spent some time focused on sexual harassment and assault. Um, I was curious if you were looking at other kinds of violence um, at Fort Hood to include, um, you know, other murders, other other high-profile incidents, um, including those, um, you know, who, who disappeared and were later found dead. Um, and I was curious. It almost sounds like political uh, talk you know, to what me. What you have found yeah. in terms of Army culture um, of how. You know the, the the brand of AWOL and the brand of you know going missing um, contributed to a uh, a lack of interest in finding them. Yes, I mean that was a a big focus of the the review and the report. We looked at crime issues on the base. We looked at crime issues off the base. I think there was a perception, really based on uh, media mm -hmm. stories, that there was some sort of crime wave uh, around the surrounding area of the base. What we found was that their, their crime rates in the areas surrounding the base were rel relatively low in comparison to other cities outside both major army installations, but other comparable sized cities. Um, that's not to say that there weren't soldier victims off the base and soldier subjects off the base because there's a large population of active duty soldiers living off base, off base yeah. retired soldiers, separated mm -hmm. soldiers and their families. So you're gonna find uh, victims off the base. But what we found really was that on the base, there were some hot crime areas that were relatively high, violent felonies, sexual assaults, mm. sex crimes, drugs, um, positive drug tests were the highest in the Army. So we, we found areas of crime on the installation 
that if you compare them to, to civilian crime rates might be low, but this is a military installation. It's a gated community. There are a lot of tools that you can use to suppress crime. What we found was that there was no proactive efforts to suppress crime. Yeah, I hope there's actually a change. Drug issues, it sounds just to like violent crimes. You know. Suicides were extremely high. And what we found was that because CID was so inexperienced and so taxed for resources, they really didn't dive deep on suicides to find out why and what what was happening that was the trigger for the suicide, the death cases. There aren't an, an anomalous number of death cases at Fort Hood um, in terms of homicides, but the homicides that, that did occur got intense media attention, and we looked very hard at those homicides. And again, what we found was in the death cases, uh, CID just needed more experience and more continuity inside the detachment there. And, and, and it may be a, a systemic across CID that there just isn't enough longevity at the post on the part of the investigators. So we rec made some recommendations regarding making sure there are experienced agents there, maybe going to more civilian investigators, and it's something we ask them to look at. Yes. Yeah, this is Jack White, and Chris is speaking to uh, some very valuable information on specific uh, criminal, uh, the viewpoint from a criminal perspective. But something else that we did here is we looked at what is it that leads a soldier to behave in this type of manner. And in the process of looking at that, we looked, uh, one, of, one of the things that the report contains uh, is looking at the other armed services, what they do well that might be able to be incorporated within what we do in the Army or what the Army does. Thanks, Bruce. One Bruce. of the things that we found Appreciate is that. that one of the other Remember. services looks at the qualities in service members that lead them to violence. Uh, the kind of violence that we don't want in uniformed personnel. And that fits, that type of That's structure question. would fit well into an army structure that looks at the whole soldier. It doesn't sound like it, but. Uh, the 21st century soldier. So we are looking at the criminal component, but we're also looking at uh, making soldiers more respectful of the contributions of other soldiers within their formations. And some of the other services do that well. Mm -hmm. And there are some aspects of what they do that we can bring in to what we do in the Army. Wow. Okay. Question in the room, Mr. Glenn. Yeah, hi, Mike Glenn with the Washington Times. Oh, it's, it's one thing about to uh, relieve of, you know, for a bunch of colonels to, and generals to be relieved. Is there anything in the report about sort of emphasizing the responsibility of the first line supervisors, the ones who actually know something's happening, the squad leaders, platoon sergeants, platoon leaders, or, or, or those, I mean, they're the ones who, who would know, will know something's going on before a division commander will ever learn. Okay, I'll, I'll start there. Uh, this is Jack White again. The answer is yes. Uh, but let, let me take your question a little bit broader. Our question, our, our mandate was not focused on attribution. Uh, and we are very clear that the problem, the problems that we saw are cultural. Uh, and everybody is involved in culture from uh, the highest levels to the one-on-one -on -one interaction between the squad leader and his or her squad member. Uh, we address all of it without attribution because accountability in that way was not our mandate. That said, yes, we focus on the importance of first line leaders knowing their soldiers and knowing where they are. Indeed, uh, part of what uh, the DOD is focused on in you know, this whole movement toward violence prevention and looking at the whole soldier is just that, those person-to-person -person interactions. And we address that in our report as well. 
Thank you. Let's go to the phone. David Bryant, Colleen Daily Herald. Are you on the phone? Do you have a question? Yes. Yes, this is Dave Bryant, the Clean Daily Herald, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, basically, what I'm wondering is, uh, have y'all made any recommendations to ensure that the lower-level units, such as your squads, platoons, and companies, actually comply with the recommendations that y'all have uh, y'all have made? So it's our recommendations that they've made, I guess. Uh, do they have? Oh, they have some sort of echo going on. Yeah, it's true, though. Do they even have to comply? It's just a recommendation. I don't know. Hopefully there's change. Is, is there going to be so real change? This, I view this as kind of tying in with the question you asked a little bit about the first line leaders. And when you have a chance to review the report in detail, you'll see, as Jack said and as Chris has said, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, details in there that go to the squad mm -hmm. leader and the platoon sergeant um, in this sense. When we were doing our interviews, both interview, in, individually and from a group perspective, one of the things we heard over and over and over again from uh, platoon sergeants and squad leaders was that they did not have the time um, to really get to know their soldiers. And for those of us who had served in the military before, it was very, very shocking because uh, we, were, we grew up in a time when the platoon sergeants and the squad leaders had sergeant time. And they knew where their soldiers were, they knew their strengths, they knew about their families, and we heard that very, very frequently. So you'll see woven into the report, I wouldn't say that there is a specific accountability line directed right at the squad leader, but as you read the report, you will see that, um, as Chris indicated, with Sharp, and with some of the other programs, they weren't being um, that's the uh, mandated down to below the brigade the alleged level. killer. And that was certainly the guy that true killed himself with respect to the uh, the platoon sergeants and the squad like leaders the girlfriend or who a strange because wife of the operation tempo because of the requirements of maintenance and everything else really um, were unable or did not take the time um, because of all the other requirements and because it wasn't emphasized to get to know their soldiers. Okay. And I, I will say, uh, just to add, I, I think that the Secretary and General McConville are very much on, on this topic. Uh, they, they've taken some steps already. They took some steps even after the interim briefing to reemphasize the role of the NCOs and uh, non-commissioned officers, the first-line supervisors, in mm. getting to know their soldiers. So if they happen to not report one day, they know exactly where to go to look for them because they know them well enough and they know what's going on in their lives. For those of you on the phone, that was Mr. White, followed by Mr. Harmon, followed by Mr. Swecker. We have time for one more question. Sig Christensen, San Antonio Express News. Are you on the line? Do you have a question? After David. Bludgeoned to death, dismembered, and burned. Jesus Christ, man. Gotta know. Steve Campion, Animals. ABC 13 Houston. Are you on the line? Do you have a question? Yes, uh, Steve Campion here with ABC 13 in Houston. We've spoken to a lot of Houston, the families Texas. of missing soldiers there at the base, including Vanessa's here in Houston. And I wanted to see if you might be able to address this. So many of them have told us when a soldier mm. goes missing there on base, uh, there wasn't a sense of urgency in finding that soldier. It was often seen that this person has gone AWOL. Can you give us a sense of what your review found in terms of that part of this equation mm. was Damn. there this lack of urgency to find soldiers who who went missing there at base for two things that we think really impacted the, that missing soldier failure to report dynamic one was we from what we saw and and actually the gan case as a case study is an example of it the the accountability for soldiers at the first muster or, or the various musters during the day had slipped. Particularly yeah, that's what they're COVID. saying. So, and and it, the part of that is a function of the NCOs, um, not again, not necessarily knowing enough about their charges, their soldiers under their supervision, to know what was normal and what was not in terms of of not reporting. The second part of it was with all the regulations and all the protocols in the army and all the procedures, there was none for a failure to report. There are rules and procedures around AWOL and when to carry that as a status, as a personnel status, 
there were rules and procedures around when to carry someone as, as a deserter, when uh, to put... It says for Aaron Robinson, according to Wikipedia, his rank was a specialist at the time of his death. So he was a combat engineer, and he held the rank of a specialist. Enter their names into the National Crime Information Center, NCIC, be on the lookout and that sort of thing. But there, at the front first line level, each NCO had to rely on their own devices and their own judgment and their own experience as to whether that failure to report was under suspicious circumstances or circumstances where the, where the soldier might be in jeopardy. And it, so it was a slippage of accountability, routine accountability, mm -hmm. combined with no real protocols or procedures in place for the NCOs in the first instance. So, so I, we describe it as an ad hoc response. Each response was different. There were no consistent responses. They now have, and we have looked at the, the missing soldier protocol that they've, they've, uh, the Army has put out, and it's a very good one. It mm -hmm. starts on hour one. In any missing person case, the first 24 hours is extremely critical. You can't get started 24 hours into it. You have to start on hour one, so an hour two. So that's where their missing soldier protocol that they're, they're promulgating now, we think, is, is hits the mark. Thank you. That concludes this briefing. Um, thank you to the members of the mm. Fort Hood Independent Review Committee for their service on behalf of the Army. Thank you. Wow. Let me read you some of these details after I think this thing is over now. Or is there other type of rest? They're supposed to be coming out with some report. I don't know how many pages they said it was a bunch of pages. They're supposed to be coming out with some official report. I maybe it's gonna be all the interviews and their findings on their investigation. Uh it says here too. The discovery remains. On June 30th, 2020, Army investigators were called when contractors discovered partial human remains along the Leon River in Belton. The area had previously been searched by Texas Rangers, detectives, and cadaver dogs on June 30th after a burn mound was discovered nearby. Investigators theorized that the remains previously buried under concrete had been dug up by wildlife. Tim Miller, uh, director of Texas EquiSearch, stated that it was the most sophisticated burial site he had ever seen. And I just kind of wonder what made it so sophisticated. Does this guy have experience, too, if it was that sophisticated? Are there other bodies, is there other people this person killed and buried? Later that evening, around 8.30 p.m., authorities re-interviewed, uh, let's see, sorry, re-interviewed Cecily, which is the other woman, the guy's estranged wife, a soldier at Fort, Fort Hood. Aguilar was reported to be the girlfriend of Aaron, a junior enlisted soldier. Robinson was the last known people to see Gillian. Guillen, sorry, Guillen, on the day of her disappearance and had previously been interviewed by authorities in the case. <sighs> Aguilar told police that Robinson told her about killing a female soldier on Fort Hood. At the request of law enforcement, Aguilar placed a controlled telephone call to Robinson, who said, baby, they found pieces and texted Aguilar multiple news articles to which he never denied anything in response. According to a criminal complaint filed by the in the Western District Court of Texas, Aguilar allegedly helped Robinson dismember Jesus and dispose of Guillen's body on April 22nd. Lord Almighty. Let me do this. Um, this was just a very off the cuff stream. Let me show you a brief. Uh, some of the other people that are covered. There was two other soldiers that are covered. And there was this other story, too. Somebody said Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg is a place in North Carolina. Just really quickly before we get to the Vanessa thing. This guy was, like, dismembered. According to this People article, Enrique Ramon Martinez was camping with friends when he went missing. Now, I don't think this is something that happened on base. Soon after the 21-year-old Army paratrooper vanished in North Carolina over the Memorial Day weekend, when did this happen? Uh, investigators said they found his remains. Now authorities have announced that 
the remains were his head and that he had been decapitated in a homicide. In May, Enrique, who had been stationed at Fort Bragg in North Carolina, was reported missing after going on a camping trip with his friends on the Outer Banks National Park Service. The group went to bed, and when they awoke, he was gone. That's just a strange-ass story. You, he's with a group of friends. They wake up, and he's just gone. And had left his cell phone, wallet, and wallet behind. During a 10-day search for him, human remains were found, washed up on a beach, and later identified through dental records as belonging to Roman Martinez. Now, a newly released autopsy conducted by the Division of Forensic Pathology at East Carolina University's Brody School of Medicine confirms a Fort Bragg soldier was the victim of a homicide. But the cause of death remains uncertain because only his head was found. Only his head. Sick ass people. See, there's things going on. They're, they were talking about there's things that are happening outside of the base because a lot of people live off base and stuff. But Fort Hood, there was a lot of crimes too. This is not a Fort Hood case, but they were saying on Fort Hood, there's a lot of there's things that happened a lot to on base crimes that were happening on base. Wow. So they don't know where this guy's body's at. It's just his head. While decapitation is in of itself universally fatal, the remainder of the body in this case was not available for examination. Therefore, potential causes of death involving the torso extremities cannot be excluded. The report states a definitive cause of death cannot be determined, but the findings in the case are most consistent with death due to homicide. When they called 911 around 7 p.m. on May 23rd, the group of soldiers camping with Roman Martinez told the dispatcher they feared he had gotten up in the middle of the night and had possibly hurt himself. That group of campers needs to be investigated, in my opinion, if they haven't been so uh, investigated already. When we woke up, he was not there. We had been looking for him all day. The unidentified caller said, according to the 911 call recording obtained by Army Times, we're trying to find a park ranger or their offices or anything. So we went all the way to the ferry and we found that we needed to dial 911. However, a Cape Lookout National Service, sorry, National Seashore spokesman disputed the group's claims, telling the Times park rangers had encountered the group earlier that day when they were asked to move their vehicles farther away from the sand dunes. So they're saying these people lied. They saw them earlier that day. They asked them with their vehicles. They didn't say anything about needing help. The rangers move on after hearing the group would comply, and the group did not mention to the rangers at this point that anyone was missing. So they're saying they lied. The autopsy found evidence of multiple chop injuries to the California native's head. According to the son, his jaw had been broken in at least two places. A toxicology report was done. The toxicology report was also done that showed there was no drugs in the system. That's horrible, man. Horrible. So, all right. Let me show, let's see this here. Let me show you guys this. This is one of the initial stories that I covered with Vanessa Guillen, but I also spoke about this soldier, Gregory. I think my he... meal kit delivery, I chose the vegetarian box, and the meals that I received were the salsa verde enchiladas, harissa sweet potato pockets, and the Mediterranean. Peter's freezing again. On 22 April, Vanessa Guillen, PFC in the 3rd Cavalry Regiment, was at her place some of duty, friends. and around noon is the last time anyone has seen her. Somebody, some person out there, has the piece of information we need to bring Vanessa home. Now, just to be clear, this video is from 
April 15th, a week before Guillen vanished from Fort Hood. Now, you can see her getting out of her white Jeep and going to get food inside Taqueta, mm. Mexico. The owner, Jaime Moreno, says Guillen will often come to his restaurant with other soldiers and friends. He knew her well. The last time he saw Guillen, she didn't seem like her normal, cheerful self. In fact, he says she seemed like she was worried about something. I am going to play the... The newer updated thing with Tim Miller because I want to see what he had to say about that burial site. Because if that burial site was sophisticated, and I'm sure this guy Tim Miller has seen many things, it just does make you kind of wonder. It's, it's not this guy's first time. A couple of updates. Uh, there's been a few updates with this story. And by the way, if you haven't seen the initial story, I'll put the link down in the comment section below. But a quick little synopsis is Vanessa went missing April 22nd, 2020. She still hasn't been found. This guy, Gregory, pops up now out of nowhere. <laughs> well, true. his body does right near the You're place. right. I should do that. Pretty crazy. And when Vanessa went missing, all of her stuff was left behind. I'm talking like keys. We don't know where her cell phone's at. Authorities say Vanessa's car keys, room key, key ID, Killing. and wallet were found in the armory room where she works, but no sign of her. Obviously and clearly, that's not a good sign, right? Somebody leaving all their stuff behind. Now, the family has uh, expressed uh, dissatisfaction with the investigation from the military. To not be transparent, to not share the information or facts as to what they did or where they searched or who they subpoenaed or what they subpoenaed, is very troubling there's too much uh quote unquote missing facts here so that video clip in the beginning where you saw vanessa walking to this restaurant i think it was called taquito something and uh, i'm going to show you a clip from the manager and um, this was the last time that he saw her in that restaurant it was like a week before her disappearance and he claimed that she seemed a little down than usual but that often um she would come in there with soldiers you know, from work, I guess, and they'd eat and they'd be happy. It's said that a client, someone who would come here often, would go missing just like that. It makes it even more sad, though, that she went missing and no one knows where she is or where she ended up. The best thing would be for her to show up, but if that doesn't happen, then the truth should come out and whoever is responsible should be held accountable for this. So fast forward now to the current time where they've been searching this area called Leon River, Texas. Every time I hear some story in Texas, I feel like I'm hearing of new places that I've never heard of before. Place is huge. And well, they've been searching this place multiple times due to a tip. They searched yesterday, today, and this. And it turns out this is where they found her, according to the to the last uh story with tim miller and vanessa this is the fifth time that they come check this area and i actually have this so they've been there a lot of times multiple times better clip that i found uh from khou that shows a better look of the area and you can also see equa search and you can see the guy i forget his name but i remember him more um from the malia davis case tim miller on the ground and on the water, Texas EquiSearch volunteers searched for 20-year-old Vanessa Guillen, a soldier from Houston, stationed at Fort Hood. We know time's not on our side. I think we're 62, 63 days today. A tip led search teams today to the Leon River, but so far, no luck. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, and when you do topics, and go sub uh, Oh. I so this is the other soldier. This is what I really wanted to show you guys, because most people know about the Vanessa. But this is Gregory Weedle. That's I say. It's just somebody will tell us where he's at, whether dead or alive. I just I need to know where my baby is. Um. Authorities found skeletal remains in a field in Colleen Friday morning. This morning, the mother Gregory Weedle Morales confirming the skeletal remains found in a Colleen field yesterday are those of her son. Gregory had been missing since August of last year. Gregory, another soldier that went missing from the base, he went missing in August. They're saying the cases are not linked, you know, but it does have the similarity of two soldiers from a base missing. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of hard to just like ignore. Now, he was found in an open field due to a tip. In the window up here, you can see. Can you imagine that? Like, I believe they were searching for Vanessa and they find they find this guy. The whole crazy field. you can see what they were doing you can see the yellow tape and we saw that they had teams coming out uh searching the area when i think about vanessa 
and I think about Gregory's story, I almost wonder if he was yeah, found he because did. of the attention that Vanessa got, you know, um, more attention on the story and missing soldiers from this base. They're going to be doing an autopsy on Gregory. Hopefully, maybe this could bring up something. Maybe they can find something's going on. And this is probably foul play. I mean, what's kind of interesting, too, is that the military, the base, right, they placed them on. I'm going to show you the clip. This uh, AWOL at first and then as desertion desertion i'm saying all right desertion so it's like i wonder if they were even really searching for him during that time he was missing you know i don't know if he, maybe they were maybe they weren't i don't know if you're put on as a wall if they're really searching for you as hard as they should be or does it kind of make it more of a dismissive type of thing well he just abandoned and if we catch him he'll be charged so how did we get to today's tragic news gregory was last heard from on august 20th of last year after his disappearance he was immediately placed as a wall and he was listed as a somebody deserter. The Army classified him as missing, issuing a reward. That reward was increased just days ago to $25,000. Today, his mom confirming his remains were found. You guys comment down below. Let me know your thoughts. Vanessa is still missing. Well, we know, we know now she was found, but uh, let me show you another quick story, and then we'll look at the Tim Miller stuff. But um, this was another guy. I actually thought about starting a series, but I just kind of fell off and I got caught up with other stuff. I thought about doing a series on Fort Hood of just all the soldiers and different stories that's happened there. I made a playlist, but never got around to covering all the ones I wanted to do. Because there's so much things that have gone on there. You could literally start a series on that. I'll start. Let's see this. Oh, wow, I didn't know this one had 90,000 views. Damn. So I'm going to skip past the Vanessa stuff because I think most people know that story. Let me go to this story maybe you've never heard about. Here we go. Now, for the next story, it's Brandon. Brandon Scott Rosecreens. He was found deceased, shot, dead. I believe it was 13 miles from the Fort Hood base, according to one of the reports that I read. Police say Rosecreens was murdered near Fort Hood, Texas on May 18th. That young man was taken just four days before his 28th birthday. Rosecreens was a quartermaster assigned to the 3rd Armed Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cavalry Division. He was serving in the United States Army at the time of his death. Now, so it's about 13 miles from the base. I mm. uh, believe police received the call around 10 a.m., they mm. go to the scene and well from one of the reports that i read brandon is deceased with a gunshot wound and his vehicle allegedly is in a different location on fire the family shared with me on what fire. A difference the army made in his life he went in as a young man and he was turning into a marvelous adult responsible young man brandon did have some awards and decorations he had a national defense service medal and the army service ribbon from what i've seen online there hasn't really been any updates to the story no suspects nobody's been caught and it's just been kind of quiet from what i've seen brandon now peacefully at rest the family says their mission now is justice Jesus. i want people when they see this to remember that we are a family and brandon is a person stabbed and burned on base got our forgot her name Wow. That's it. There was a, a story too about the whole prostitution prostitution thing that happened, or somebody in the base that was into a prostitution ring. Just kind of crazy. Uh, let me pull up uh, really quickly. I guess we could probably end off on this. Uh, let me see if I can find that video again, real quick. Oh yeah, I wanted to look at this with you guys. More remains found at the search site for Vanessa Guillen. Search teams were back in the spot where they found human remains in a shallow grave roughly 30 miles from Fort Hood. Today, crews discovered more remains. And this is where investigators found the first piece of evidence mm. that led them to believe the search for Vanessa Guillen was close to over. We know immediately that, yep. To over. We know immediately. The evidence. I wonder if that's... The exact thing. I close this. Wow. I mean, I don't know. I guess this is the area or the search, the burial site. It's kind of weird, creepy. I mean, there's a hole in the ground, so I, I guess that's it. 
evidence that led them to believe the search for Vanessa Guillen was close to over. We know immediately that yep, we're, we're in the right spot. Texas Equisearch's Tim Miller says the evidence they found was the lid to a Pelican storage case. A case a witness says they saw being loaded into a car around 830 at night mm. around the time Vanessa disappeared. Miller says the spot where they found remains was well concealed. It appears that they buried her, put lime on her, mixed up concrete, put that over, put dirt over it. Night at top oh, police can put that over, they buried The spot well, where they found remains was well concealed. It appears that they buried her, put lime on her, mixed up concrete, put that over, put dirt over Buried her and put what? Concrete? What? Well concealed. It appears that they buried her, put lime on her. Put something on her. Up concrete, concrete. Put that over, put dirt over it. Concrete and dirt over it. So he was talking about like a sophisticated burial site. Crystal, thank you for the super chat. And Lisa, thank you for the PayPal the other day. I really appreciate that. That was really nice. It seems like this guy had experience. I don't know. Who kills for the first time and buries somebody for the first time and does some sort of sophistication of uh Putting her, I mean, the storage container isn't that sophisticated, but the way he was, she was buried. Where they found remains was well concealed. It appears I buried her, put lime on her. Put something on her. Lime, lime. Oh, thank you guys in the chat. Lie or lime? So what does lime do? I've heard that kind of, that you can put lime and it eats away at the bones and stuff. I, I remember there was like this big Mexico serial killer or something where they one day found this mass grave and i think it was mostly women that were deceased and the guy had been putting lime i think on their i guess body or bones and that like it really does start to eat away i guess at the so this guy went really was trying to hide her Mixed up concrete, put that over, put dirt over it, rocks and stuff. Overnight video shows wow. the scene where Colleen police so confronted the suspect. They say he ultimately took his own life. But the Army says there's another suspect in custody, a civilian, the estranged wife of a different man, who they say is a former Fort Hood soldier. Meantime, back here in Houston. It's just important for for people to remember her. A mural of Guillen mm. went up tonight at Taqueria del Sol, a popular restaurant on the south side. Turkey. People came crying and calling for justice and answers. I'm from, from this neighborhood and, and so was she, so, so I, I had to do it. The remains mm. have not been positively identified, but searchers believe it is Vanessa Guillen. The Army has not released a connection between these two suspects but they're planning a press conference for tomorrow at 2 o'clock at Fort Hood. Back to you. We heard some disturbing details. No doubt it was a difficult day for Vanessa Guillen's family. Grace, thank you. Jesus Christ. Uh, and I hope some change comes out of this. Uh, you know, I mean, we watched the press conference. I hope it's just not some sort of political talk and nothing happens. Um, here real quick. Hmm. This might be the guy I was talking about, though. There's so many serial killers, apparently. Hmm. Fernando Hernandez Leva. I just wanted to see the lime reference. I mean, I don't want to be, I don't want to. Let me type in his name, see real quick what pops up. I don't know, I don't know if it's that guy or not. Jesus. No. Anyway, I think we'll end off the stream on that. I don't want to pull up just random stuff. I'm not too sure about it. But yeah, thank you guys for joining. Oh, I want to ask you guys real quick, too, while we're here. I was planning on another live stream. I was kind of putting together a story. A couple of people requested it. 
Um, Alexis Sharkey. I don't know if you heard of that woman. I don't know if you guys would like to see a live stream on that. I started preparing clips, started putting stuff together. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Maybe today or tomorrow I'll do this live stream. Tonight or tomorrow. I just want to make sure I get all the information collected and all the different video clips. But it's it's kind of a, a mystery. Who are you looking for? I was looking for a Mexico Mexican serial killer. I just can't remember his name. That he killed a bunch of people, and I think it was mostly women. And I believe, from what I heard, is he used lime. And the the way he got caught was because something about a trailer. He tried luring some woman into his trailer, and I think she got away or something like that. I just can't remember this guy's name. I think it was, and the, and what I'm looking now is just a lot of different serial killers. Apparently, there's a lot of killings that go on go on in Mexico too. Mexico serial killers. Lord, so many horrific stuff. Yeah, no. But yeah, thank you guys for joining. I appreciate it. This is on the Fort Hood murders. Um, and if you guys have any requests for stories, I think this might be the next live stream that we do, Alexis Sharkey. Um, but if you guys have any interesting stories, that's enough to do a live stream because you got to have enough content to do a live stream. You know, some of the stories are very brief, open and shut, and there's not much to talk about. But yeah, if you have any suggestions, just message me. You guys have a great day. Take care of yourselves. Uh, peace. Please hit like and subscribe.